The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's start. So we were talking about melting in two dimensions. And the picture that we had was something like a triangular lattice, which at zero temperature has particles sitting at precise sites, let's say, on this triangular lattice. But then at finite temperature, the particles will start to deform and the deformations were indicated by a vector u. And the idea was that uh, this is like an elastic material, as long as we are thinking about these uh, long wavelength deformations u. And the energy cost can be written for an isotropic material in two dimensions in terms of uh, two invariants, and traditionally it is written in terms of the so-called Lamé coefficients uh, mu and lambda. Where uh, this uij, which is the strain, is obtained by taking derivatives of the deformation, the i u j, and symmetrizing it. This symmetrization essentially eliminates an, ener an energy cost for rotations. And then, because of this simple quadratic translational invariant form, we could also express this in terms of Fourier modes. And I'm going to write the Fourier description slightly differently than last time. Basically, this whole form can be written as uh, mu plus 2 lambda over 2 q dot u tilde of q squared. And the other term rather than previously I had written things in terms of q dot u and q squared u squared, I will write it in terms of q crossed with u tilde of q squared. Okay. And essentially you can see that this clarifies that they are going to have modes that are in the direction of Q, the longitudinal modes, the cost is mu plus 2 lambda. And those that are transverse or orthogonal to the direction of Q, whose uh, cost is just mu. And clearly, if I were to go into real space, this is kind of related to a divergence of U. And divergence of U corresponds to essentially squeezing or expanding this deformation field. So what this measures is essentially the cost of changing the density. And this combination is related to the bulk modulus. You have that even for a liquid. So if you have a liquid, you try to squeeze it, there will be a bulk energy cost. And this term, which in the real space is kind of related to curl u, you would say is corresponding to making rotations. So if you try to rotate this material locally, then the corresponding shear cost of the formation has a cost that is indicated by mu, the shear modulus. And uh, basically, what really makes a solid is this term, because as I said, a liquid also has the bulk modulus but lacks the resistance to try to shear it. 
which is captured by this that is unique and characteristic of a solid. Okay. So this is the energy cost. The other part of this whole story is that this structure has order. And we can characterize that order, which makes it distinct from a liquid or a gas, a number of ways. One was to do an X-ray scattering, and then we would see the back peaks. And really, that type of order is translational. And we characterize that by an order parameter. It's kind of like the spin that we would have in the case of a magnet being up or down. In this case, this object was e to the i g dot u, the deformation that you have at some location r. Or, and when these g's are chosen to be the inverse lattice vectors, it doesn't really matter whether I write here u of r or the actual position, because the actual position starts at zero temperature with the value r0, such that the dot, dot product of that with g is some multiple of 2 pi. And so essentially, that's really what captures this. Clearly, if I start with the zero temperature picture and just move this around, the phase of this order parameter over here will change, but it will be the same across the system. And so this long range correlation that is present at zero temperature, we can ask how, what happens to it at finite temperature. So we can look at uh, rho g at some position, rho g star at some other position. And so that was related to exponential of minus g squared over 2, uh, something like u squared x, or u of x minus u of 0 squared. And what we saw was that this thing had a characteristic that it was falling off with distance according to some kind of uh, 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 power law. The exponent of this power law we calculated clearly is related to this g squared, because this is the quantity that grows logarithmically. And so the answer was g squared over 4 pi. It was dependent on these two modes being present. So you have mu 2 mu plus lambda and then p mu plus lambda. You had a form such as this. Now this result was obtained as long as we were treating this field U as just a continuum field that satisfies this. And this result is clearly different also from the expectation that at very high temperature, a particle in a liquid should not know anything about a particle further out in the liquid as long as they are beyond some small uh, correlation length. So we expect this to actually decay exponentially at high temperatures. And we found that uh, we could account for that by uh, addition of these locations. Can cause a transition to a high temperature phase in which rho g, rho g star between x and 0 decays exponentially as opposed to this algebraic behavior, indicating that these locations, once you go to sufficiently high temperature, 
such that the entropy of creating and rearranging these dislocations overcomes the large cost of creating them in the first place, then you will have uh, uh, this uh, absence of translational order and some kind of uh, exponential decay of this order parameter. Okay, so at this stage, we may feel comfortable enough to say that addition of these dislocation causes our solid to melt and become a liquid. Now, I indicated, however, that the solid also has orientational order. What I could do is at each location in the solid, I can ask, well, how much has the angle been deformed? And look at the bond angle. So maybe this particle moved here, this particle moved here. Somewhere else, the particles may have moved in a different fashion. And the angle that was originally, say, along the x direction had rotated somewhere else. And clearly, again, at zero temperature, I can look at the correlations of this angular order, and they will be the same all across the system. I can ask what happens when I include these deformations and then the dislocations. So in the same way that we defined a translational order parameter, I can define an orientational order parameter. Let's call it psi at some location r, which is e to the i theta at that location r. Except that when I look at the triangular lattice, it may be that the triangles have actually rotated by 60 degrees, 120 degrees, and I can't really tell whether I clicked once, zero times, twice, etc. So because of this symmetry of the original lattice under theta going to theta plus 2 pi over uh, 6, I have to use something like this that will not be modified if I make this transformation, even at zero temperature. If I uh, miscount some angle by 60 degrees, this will become fine. Okay. Now, I want to calculate the correlations of this theta from one part of the system to another part of the system. So for that, what I need to do is to uh, look at uh, the relationship between theta and the distortion field u that I told you before. Now. You can see that right on the top right corner, I took the distortion field, and I took its derivative and then symmetrized the resulting tensor. And that symmetrization actually removes any rotation that I would have. So in order to bring back the rotation, I just have to put a minus sign. And indeed, one can show that the uh, distortion or displacement u of r across my system, let's call it u of x, leads to a corresponding angular distortion theta at x, which is minus 1 half, let's call it z hat dotted with curl of uh, u. So if rather than doing di uj plus dj ui, if I put a minus sign, you can see that I have the structure of a curl. In two dimensions, actually, curl would be something that would be pointing only along the z direction. And so I just make a scalar by dot producting that with the z direction. And so that 
you can do some distortion and convince yourself that for each distortion you will get an angle that is this. Do you need some kind of normalization to fix the dimensions of this? Because technically you have dimensions of field and you're dividing I'm only talking okay. about two dimensions. And in any case, you can see that u is a distortion, it is a displacement. The gradient is with respect to displacement. Oh. So this thing is dimensionless as okay. long as z hat is dimensionless. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes. That's a 2, right? Not a z. That's a 2. In, it's the same 2 that I have for the definition of the strain. Rather than a plus, you put a minus. Okay. So can we think of these as like two sets of Goldstone modes, or is that not like a way to interpret it? the two order parameters. Okay. I mean, you have like a beta that has a U dependence, but. Okay, so let's look at this picture over here. We do have two sets of Goldstone modes corresponding to the longitude and online transfers. You can see that this curl is the thing that I call the angle. Sure. So if you like, you can put the angle <coughs> over here, okay? But the difference between putting an angle here and this term is that in terms of the angle, there is no Q dependence. So it is not a Goldstone mod because the cost of making a, uh, a distortion of wave number Q does not vanish as Q squared for this. Okay? All right, so then I can look at the correlation between, say, psi of X psi star of uh, zero. And what I will be calculating is uh, expectation value of e to the i six. And then I will have this factor of uh, uh, okay. so let's let me write it in this fashion. Theta of x minus theta of zero. Since u is Gaussian distributed, theta will be Gaussian distributed. So for any Gaussian distributed entity, we can write the exponential of e to the something as its average as exponential of minus one half the average of the uh, whatever is in the exponent. So I will get 36 divided by two. I will have uh, the expectation value of delta theta squared, but delta theta is related up to this factor of one quarter to some expectation value of curl u. So I would need to calculate curl u at x minus curl u at zero, the whole thing squared with the Gaussian average. Okay. Now, this entity, clearly what I can do is to go back and look at these things in terms of uh, position space, uh, sorry, in terms of Fourier space rather than position space. So this becomes an integral d2q 2 pi to the d. I will get e to the i q dot x minus one, and then I will have something like q cross u tilde of q, and I have to do that twice. When I do that twice, I find that the different q's are uncorrelated, so I will get rather than two of these integrals, one of these integrals, and because the q and q prime are said to be the same, the product of those two factors will give the usual 2 minus 2 cosine of q dot x term that we are used to. And so that's where the x dependence appears. And then I need the average of q cross mu of q. And that I can read off the way that I wrote the energy over here. You can see that there is a Gaussian cost for Q cross 
u of q squared, which is simply 1 over mu invariance. So basically, this term will simply give me a 1 over mu. Now, the difference between all of the calculations that we were doing previously, as was asked regarding Goldstone modes, if I, didn't, if I was just looking at u squared, which is what I was doing up here, I would need to put another factor of 1 over q squared here. And then I would have the Coulomb integral. It would grow logarithmically. But here you can see that the whole thing, the cosine integrated against the constant will average out to 0. So I will simply have 2 over u times this integral, which is a constant. So the whole thing at the end of the day is exponential of uh, that becomes 9 divided by 2. There is a factor of 1 over mu. And then I have twice the integral of the 2q over 2 pi squared, which is, you can convince yourself, simply the density of the system, the number of points. So as opposed to the translation or order, which was decaying as a power law when we include the phonon modes. When we include these phonon modes, we find that the orientational order decays much more weakly. So that was falling off as I went further and further. This, as I go further and further, eventually reaches a constant that is less than 1, but it's something mu is inversely proportional to temperature. So as I go to zero temperature, this goes to one. Okay. And basically, because this order parameter with respect to, well, this measure of distortion with respect to that measure of distortion has an additional factor of gradient, I will get an additional factor of Q squared, and then everything changes accordingly. So orientation order is much more robust. This phase that we were calling the analog of a two-dimensional solid had only quasi-long range order. The long range order was decaying as a power law, but it has true orientational order. Yes? Is n dependent on the position or? No. no. So this is, so basically if you remember the number of points, should be the same as the number of allowed Fourier modes. And this goes to an integral d2q over 2 pi squared when I put the area, I guess, in two dimensions. So the integral over whatever Birlohan zone you have over the Fourier modes is the same thing as the number of points that you have in the original lattice divided by area or some one over the size of one of those triangles. Square. Yes? Where is the x, x, x dependence in the expression? Okay, the x dependence basically disappears because you, you integrate over cosine of qx, and if x is sufficiently large, those fluctuations disappear. That's what we're looking at the large. Number. Yeah, that's right. So at short distances, there will be some oscillations or whatever, but you gradually we are interested in long distance behavior. At very short distances, I can't even use the continuum description for things that are three or four lattice spacings apart. OK? So OK, so maybe I should explicitly say that this is usually called quasi-long range order versus this dependence, which is too long. OK. So given that this is more robust when we include uh, these uh, phonon-like fluctuations, the next question is, well, does it completely disappear when I include these dislocations. So again, this calculation based on Gaussians 
relies on just the uh, Fourier modes of that line that I have up there. It does not include the dislocations, which in order to properly account, we saw that we need to look at uh, a collection of dislocations appearing at different positions on the lattice. And they had these uh, vectorial nature of the Coulomb interactions among them. So presumably, when I go into the phase where uh, dislocations unbind, and by unbinding, as I said, that in the low temperature picture, the dislocations should appear very close to each other because it is costly to separate them by an amount that grows logarithmically in the separation. In the unbound phase, you have essentially a gas of dislocations that can be anywhere. So the picture here now is that indeed this is a phase that if I just focus on the dislocations, there's a whole bunch of them for the triangular lattice. They could be pointing in any one of three directions, uh, plus or minus. And then there is certainly an additional contribution to the angle that comes from the presence of these dislocations. So you calculate if you have a dislocation that has index B, let's say at the origin, what kind of angular distortion does it cost? And you find that it goes like B dot X divided by absolute value of X. This is for one dislocation. This is the theta that you would get for that dislocation at location x. Okay. And uh, essentially, you can see that if I were to replace the u that I have here with the u that was caused by a dislocation, you would get something like this formula. Because remember, the u that was caused by the dislocation was something like the gradient of a log potential. And uh, comes kind of harder to what maybe I'll make an attempt to write it. So let's take a gradient of theta. Okay. Gradient of theta, if I use that formula, you would say, OK, I have minus 1 half z hat dot curl of something. And if I take a gradient of a curl, the answer should be 0. But that's as long as this u is a well-defined object. And our task was to say that this u, when you have these dislocations, is not a well-defined object in the sense that you take the curl and the gradient and you would get 0. So essentially, I will transport the gradient all the way over here. And the part of u that will survive that is the one that is characterized by this dislocation field. Okay. Now, you can see that this object kind of looks like a Laplacian of this distortion. It's two derivatives of this distortion field that had this logarithm in it. And when you take two derivatives of a logarithm, you get a delta function. So if you do things correctly, you will find that this answer here becomes a sum over i, bi, delta function of uh, 
xr minus xi or x minus xi. So basically, each dislocation at location xi, again depending on its v being in which direction, gives a contribution to gradient of theta. And if I were to take the gradient of the expression that I have over here, gradient of this object is also, this is like the field that you have for the logarithmic potential, will give you the delta function. So that's where the simil similarity comes. So then the full answer turns out to be if you have a sum over these locations, you sum over the distor uh, distortion fields that each one of them is causing, and you would have a form such as this. Yes? Should the denominator be squared? Uh, yes, that's right. The, the potential goes logarithmically. The field, which is the gradient of the potential, falls off as one over separation. So since I put a separation out there, I have to put the separation squared. Okay. All right. So you can see that the singular part, the part that arises from these locations, if I have a soup of these locations, I can figure out what theta is. Okay. Now what I will look for, uh, okay, actually I was kind of hinting at that. If I take the gradient of theta, uh, and I forgot to put a factor of 1 over 2 pi here, because the, for uh, vortices that had charge 2 pi, I had the potential that was 1 over r. So for these locations, it becomes b over 2 pi. If I take the gradient, then the gradient uh, translates to sum over i, the i delta function of uh, x minus xi, the expression that I had written over there. And if I do the Fourier transform, you see what I did over here was essentially to look at theta in Fourier space. So let's do something similar here. So when I do the Fourier transform of this, I will get IQ, the Fourier transform of this angular field. And on the right hand side, what I would get is essentially the Fourier transform of the field of these locations. So I have defined my V of Q to be sum over I e to the I Q dot position of the ith dislocation, the vector that characterizes the ith dislocation. And it would make sense to also include the normalization that is 1 over the square root of area. If you don't do that, then at some other point, you have to worry about the normalization. OK? Uh, ba, 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 ba. Right. So if I just multiply both sides by Q, and I think I forgot the minus sign throughout, which is not that important, but theta tilde of Q becomes I Q dot B of Q divided, maybe I should really call this B tilde, divided by Q squared. So this is important. Essentially, you take the collection of uh, dislocations in this picture, 
and you calculate what their Fourier transform is, call that the tilde of Q. Essentially divide by one factor of Q and you will get the corresponding angular field. Okay. Now, what I needed to evaluate for here was the average of theta tilde of Q squared. And you can see that if I write this explicitly, let's say, as Q alpha, Q beta, sorry, Q alpha, D tilde alpha, then there are two of them. I will get Q beta, D tilde of beta, and then I will have a Q to the fourth. Okay. And the average over here becomes the average over all contributions of these dislocations that I can put, put across my system. Okay. Now explicitly I'm interested in the limit where Q goes to zero. So these things depend on Q, but I'm interested in the limit as Q goes to zero, especially what happens to this average. it becomes multiplying two of these things together. Uh, actually, in the limit where Q goes to zero, what I have is the sum over all of the Bs. Right? So in the limit where Q goes to zero, this becomes an integral or a uh, sum. It doesn't matter which one of them I write. Q has gone to zero, so I basically need to look at the average of the alpha of x, the beta of x prime, divided by r. So what is there in the numerator? You can see that in the numerator, as Q goes to zero, what I'm looking at is the sum of all of the dis, uh, dis, dis, uh, dislocations that I have in the system. Now, the average of the sum is zero because in all of our calculations, we were restricting to configurations that were neutral. Because if I go beyond neutrality, it just costs too much. But what I'm looking at is not the average of B, which is zero, but the average of B squared, which is the variance. So essentially, I have a system that has a large area A. It is on average neutral. And the question is, what is the variance of the net charge? And my claim is that the variance of the net charge is by central limit theorem proportional to the area. Actually, it is proportional to the units that are independent from each other. So roughly, I would expect that in this high temperature phase, I have a correlation length C. And within each portion of size C, I will be neutral. But when I go between things that are more than C apart, there is no reason to maintain neutrality. So overall, I have something like throwing coins, where at each one of them, the average is 0, with probability being up or down. But when I look at the variance for the entire thing, the average will be proportional to the area in units of these things that are independent of each other. Uh, there was from the normalization factor of 1 over area. And this really I should write as a proportionality, because I don't know precisely what the relationship between this independent size, that correlation length, but they have to be roughly proportional to each other. Okay. So what do we conclude? We conclude that the limit as uh, Q goes to 0 
of the average of my theta tilde of q squared is a structure such as this. I forgot to put one more thing here. I don't expect to be any correlations between the x component or y component of this answer, the variance, the covariance of the dislocations in one direction and the other direction. So I put the delta function there. If I put this over here, I will get a q squared divided by q to the fourth. So I will get a uh, 1 over q squared. And I have this c squared. And there is some unknown coefficient. So it's interesting because we started without thinking about dislocations, just in terms of the distortion field. And we said that this object is related to the angle. And indeed, we had this distortion that the energy cost of distortions is proportional to angle squared. And that angle, therefore, is not a Goldstone mode because it doesn't go like Q squared. Now, we go to this other phase now with dislocations all over the place. And we calculate the expectation value of theta squared. And it looks like it came from a theory that was like Goldstone modes. Right? So you would say that once I am in this phase where the dislocations are unbound, there is an effective energy cost for these changes in angle that is proportional to gradient of the angle squared. So that in Fourier space, this would go to Ka over 2 integral d2 q 2 pi squared q squared theta tilde of q squared. So that if you had this theory, you would definitely say that the expectation value of theta tilde of q squared is 1 over Ka q squared. Variance is Ka q squared inverse. You compare those two things, and you find that once the dislocations have unbound, and there is a correlation length that essentially tells you how far the dislocations are talking to each other and maintaining neutrality, uh, that there is actually an effective stiffness, like a Goldstone mode for angular distortions that is proportional to c squared. And hence, if I were to look at the orientation of order correlations, I would essentially have something like expectation value of theta q squared, which is 1 over q squared. I fully transform that. I get the log. And so I will get something that falls off the distance to some other exponent that I will call eta psi. Okay. Now, if I have a true liquid in a liquid, Again, maybe in a neighborhood of seven or eight particles, neighbors, etc., they talk to each other and the orientations are correlated. But when I go from one part of the liquid to another part of the liquid, there is no correlation between bond angles. I expect these things to decay exponentially. So what we've established is that neither the phonons nor the dislocations are sufficient to give the exponential decay that you expect for the bond uh, 
So this object has quasi Lagrange order versus what I expect to happen in the liquid, which is exponential of minus x over psi. Okay. So the unbinding of these locations gives rise to a new phase of matter that has this quasi long range order in the orientations. It has no positional order. It's a kind of a liquid crystal that is called a hexat. Correlation where you got one over k q squared. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that assume that you can you are allowing the angle to vary minus infinity to infinity when you do your averaging? What about the restriction? To okay. The so, what is the variance of the angle here? Okay, there is a variance of the angle that is controlled by this one over k a. Right. So, if I go back and calculate things in real space. I will find that if I look at theta at location x minus theta at location 0, the answer is going to go like 1 over k logarithm of x. Okay? So what it says is that if things are close enough to each other, and this is in units of 1 over a, up to some factor, let's say log 5, etc., so I don't go all the way to infinity, the fluctuations in angles are inversely set by a parameter that we see as I approach uh, right after the transition is very large. So in the same sense that previously for the positional uh, correlations I had the temperature being small and inverse temperature being large limiting the size of the translational fluctuations, here the same thing happens for the bond angle fluctuations close to the uh, transition, they are actually small. So the question that you asked, you could have certainly also asked over here. That is, uh, when I'm thinking about the distortion field, the distortion field is certainly going to be limited. If it becomes as big as this, then it doesn't make sense. So given that, what sense or what justification do I have in making these Gaussian integrals? And the answer is that while it is true that it is fluctuating, uh, as I go to low temperature, the degree of fluctuations is very small. So effectively, uh, what I have is that I have to integrate over some finite interval a function that kind of looks like this. And the fact that I replace that with a uh, integration from minus infinity to infinity rather than from minus a to a just doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So we know that ultimately we should get this. But so far we've only gotten this. So what should we do? Well, we say, OK, we encountered this difficulty before in something that looked like an angle in the xy model, that at low temperature had power law decays, whereas we knew that at high temperatures it would have to have exponential decay. And what we said was that we need these topological defects in angle. So what we need topological defects or in our case theta is a bond angle okay and these topological defects in the bond angle have a name they're called disclination And very roughly, they correspond to something like this. Suppose this is the center 
of one of these disclinations and then maybe next to this here I have locally at the distance <coughs> r if I look at a point I would see that the bonds that connect it to its neighbor have an orientation such as the one that I have indicated over here okay now what I want to do is as I go around and make a circuit that this angle theta that I have here to be zero rotates and comes back up to 60 degrees so essentially what I do is I take this line and I gradually uh, shift it around so that by the time I come back I have rotated by 60 degrees kind of hard for me to draw that but you can imagine what I have to do so what I need to do is to have the integral over a circuit that encloses this disclination such that when I do a ds dotted with the gradient of the bond orientational angle, I come back to pi over 6 times some integer. And again, I expect the weakest dislocations that correspond to uh, uh, minus plus one. Then the cost of these is obtained by taking this distortion field gradient of theta whose magnitude at the distance r from the center of this object is going to be one over two pi r times uh, uh, pi over six times whatever this integer n is. And then if I substitute this 1 over r behavior in this expression, which is the effective energy of this entity, I will get a logarithmic cost for creating a single disclination, which means that at low temperature, I have to create disclination pairs. And then there will be an effective interaction between disclination pairs that is uh, we can in exactly the same way that we calculated for the XY model. So up to just this minor change that the charge of a defect is reduced by a factor of six, this theory is identical to the theory of the unbinding of the XY model, the polar defects, yes? Uh, why is it pi over six and not two pi over six? You are right, it should be two pi over six. Yes. Um, so when you're saying that the, so the existence of this hexatic phase uh, in, would require the uh, dislocations to occur to right. decouple at lower temperature right. than orientational uh, yes. defects. Is there an analogous case where, I guess you can't have dislocations in the orientation without no. So if you try to make these objects in the original case, in the original lattice, you'll find that their cost grows actually like L squared log L, as opposed to the dis dislocations whose cost only grows as uh, uh, log L. So these entities are extremely unlikely to occur in the original system. If you sort of go back and ask, okay, what, what do they actually correspond to? If you have a picture that you have generated on the computer, they're actually reasonably easy to identify because the centers of these disclinations correspond to having points that have rather than six neighbors, five or seven neighbors. And so you generate a picture and you find mostly you have neighborhoods with six uh, uh, neighbors and then there's a site where there's five neighbors another site that's seven neighbors five seven come more or less in pairs and you, you can identify these dis disclination pairs reasonably easy okay so at the end of the day the picture that we have is something like this that we are starting with the 
triangular lattice that I drew at the beginning and we are increasing temperature and we are asking what happens. So this is zero temperature. Close to zero temperature, what we have is an entity that has uh, translational quasi long range order. So this quantity goes like one over x to this power eta g. Whereas the orientations go to a constant. Okay. Now, this eta g is there because there is a shear modulus. And so throughout this space, I have a shear modulus the parameter that I'm calling mu, I had scaled inversely with temperature, so I have this shear modulus mu that diverges once we scale by temperature as one over temperature, but then as I come down, the reduction is more than one over temperature because I will have this effect of these locations appearing in pair and the system becomes softer and eventually we'll find that there is a transition temperature at which the shear modulus drops down to zero and we said that uh, near this transition there is this behavior that mu approaches mu c uh, whatever it is with something let's call this uh, t1 t1 minus t to this exponent mu bar, which was 0.36963. Okay. Now, once we are beyond this temperature T1, then our positional correlations decay exponentially with some correlation length C. And this C is something that diverges on approaching this transition. So basically, I have a C that goes up here to infinity. And the fact that we, if we calculate the C, it diverges according to this strange formula that was 1 over uh, t minus t1 to this exponent mu bar. Very strange type of divergence. Uh, but then associated with the presence of this C is the fact that when you look at the orientational correlations, they don't decay as an exponential but as a power law eta of c, and this eta of c is related to this ka and falls off as 1 over c squared. So here it diverges as you approach this transition. Now as we go further and further on, the disclinations will appear disclinations will weaken uh, the resolve of the angles to be parallel to each other. And there is another transition that is costly stallest like at which this is going to suddenly go down to zero. And close to here, we have that eta C reaches the critical value of one quarter with the square root of uh, uh, let's call it uh, T2 with the square root singularity. And then finally we have the ordinary liquid phase where additionally I will find that psi 6 of x 
psi star 6 of 0 decays exponentially let's call it psi 6 and this psi 6 is something that will diverge at this transition as uh, exponential of minus 1 over square root of t minus t2. Okay. So this is the current scenario of what is how melting could occur for a system of uh, particles in two dimensions. If it is a continuous phase transition, it has to go through these two transitions with the intermediate exotic phase. Of course, it is also possible, and typically people were seeing numerically when they were doing hard spheres, etc., that there is a direct transition from here to here which is discontinuous, like you have in three dimensions. So that scenario of a discontinuous transition is not ruled out. But if you have continuous transitions, it has to have this intermediate phase in go to this. OK? Any questions? Yes. So the red one is mu, the yellow one is eta psi, eta psi and the purple one is eta psi. The correlation length that I okay. would put here. So it's not? Yeah, so there are three different entities. OK. So throughout the course, we have been thinking about systems that are described by some kind of an equilibrium probability distribution. So what we did not discuss is how the system comes to that equilibrium. So we are going to now very briefly talk about dynamics. And the specific type of dynamics that is common to condensed matter systems at finite temperature, which I would call dissipative dynamics. And the prototype of this is a Brownian particle that I will briefly review for you. So what you have is that you have a particle that is within some kind of a solvent. And this particle is moving around. So you would say, let's, for simplicity, actually focus only on one direction, x. And you would say that the mass of the particle times its acceleration is equal to the forces that is it's, it's uh, experiencing. And the forces, well, if you are moving in a fluid, you are going to be subject to uh, some kind of a dissipative force, which is typically proportional to your velocity. If you, for example, solve for the hydrodynamics of a sphere in a fluid, you find that mu is related to viscosity inversely to the size of the particle, etc. But that behavior is generic. You're not going to be thinking about that. Now, suppose that additionally, uh, I put some kind of a uh, 
optical trap or something that tries to uh, localize this potential. So then there would be an additional force due to uh, the derivative of the potential with respect to x. And then we are talking about Brownian particles. Brownian particles are constantly jiggling. So there is also a random force that is a function of time. Now, we are going to be interested in the dynamics that is very much controlled by the dissipation term. And acceleration, we can forget. And if we are in that limit, we can write the equation as mu, uh, I can sort of rearrange it slightly as, uh, actually, let me change notation to this, uh, so that the eventual velocity x dot is going to be proportional to the external force with a coefficient that is the mobility. So mu is essentially relates the force to uh, the velocity. Of course, this is the average force. And uh, there is a fluctuating part. So essentially, I call mu times this to be the eta as a function of t. Okay. Now, if I didn't have this, external force, the fluctuations of the particle would be diffusive. And you can convince yourself that you can get the diffusive result, provided that you relate the correlations of this force that fluctuating and has zero average to the diffusion constant d of the particle in the medium through delta of t minus theta. Okay. So if the trap was not there, you solve this equation without the trap, and you find that the probability distribution for x grows as a Gaussian uh, whose width grows with time as dt. d, therefore, must be the diffusion constant. Now, in the presence of the potential, this particle will start to fluctuate. Eventually, if you wait long enough, there is a probability that it will be here, the probability to be somewhere else. So at long enough times, there is a probability p of x to find the particle. And you expect that p of x will be proportional to exponential of minus v of x divided by whatever the temperature is. Okay. And you can show that in order to have this occur, you need to relate mu and d through the so-called Einstein relation. So this is a brief review of Brownian uh, particles. Yes. The average and uh, cor time correlation, I guess, of eta mm -hmm. can be found by setting the potential to zero, mm -hmm. right? But those will still be true even if the potential is not zero, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to sort of have an idea of where this D comes from. But more specifically, this is the important thing. That if at very long times you want to have a probability distribution coming from this equation that has the Gaussian S, that has the Boltzmann form with KT, the coefficients of mu 
and the noise you have to relate through the so-called Einstein relation. And once you do that, this result is true no matter how complicated this V of X is. Okay? So in general, for a complicated V of X, you won't be able to solve this equation analytically. You can only do it numerically. Yet you are guaranteed that this equation with this noise correlator will have asymptotically a probability distribution that is given by this. Okay? But the problem that we have been looking at all along is something different. We have, let's say, a piece of magnet or some other system that we characterize, let's say, by some field m of x. Again, you can do it for vector, but for simplicity, let's do it for the scalar case. So we know or we have stated that subject to the symmetries of the system, I know the probability for some configuration of this field is governed by a form, let's say, that has the Landau Ginzburg character. So that has been our starting point. We have said that I have a probability distribution that is of this form. So that statement is kind of like this statement. But the way that I came to that statement was to say that there was a degree of freedom x, the position of the particle, that was fluctuating subject to forces and external variables from the particles of the fluid that was given by this so-called Langevin equation. So I had a time-dependent prescription that eventually went to the Boltzmann weight that I wanted. Here I have started with the final Boltzmann weight. And the question is, can I think of a dynamics for a field that will eventually give me this state? So what I, there are lots and lots of different dynamics that I can impose, but I want to look at the dynamics that is closest to the Brownian particle that I wrote, and that's where this word dissipative again comes. So among the universe of all possible dynamics, I'm going to look at one that has a linear time derivative for the field M. Okay? And uh, so this is the analog of the x dot. And so I write that it is equal to some coefficient that determines the ease with which that particle, well, the field at location x changes as a function of the forces that is exerted on it. I assume that that mu is the same across my system. So here, I'm already assuming there's no x dependence. The system is uniform. And then there was a dv by dx. So v was ultimately the thing that was appearing in the Boltzmann weight. So clearly, the analog of the v that I have is this Landau Ginzburg. So I will do a functional derivative of this quantity that I will call beta h. with respect to m 
of x. Okay? Again, over there I had one variable x. You can imagine that I could have had a system where two particles, x1 and x2, also have an interaction among them. Then the equation that I would have had over there would be the force that is acting on particle 1 by taking the total potential, which is the external potential plus the uh, potential that uh, uh, comes from the interparticle interaction. So I would have to take a derivative of the net potential energy V divided uh, with respect to either x1 or x2 to calculate the force on the first one or the second one. So here, for a particular configuration M of the field across the system, if I'm interested in the dynamics at this po position X, I have to take this total Hamiltonian or potential energy and take the derivative with respect to the variable that is sitting at that side. So that's why this is a functional derivative of this entity. And then I will have to put a noise, eta. Well, again, if I had multiple particles, I would subject each one of them to an independent noise. So at each location, I have an independent noise. Okay. So the noise is a function of time, but it is also varying across my system. Okay. So if I take that form and do the functional derivative, so if I'm taking the derivative with respect to m of x, I have to take the derivative of these objects. So I will have minus derivative of tm squared is tm, um to the fourth is 4 um cubed, and so forth. Once I have gotten rid of these terms, then I would have terms that depend on the gradient. So I would have minus the derivative of this object with respect to the gradient. So here I would get k gradient of m. And then the next term would be Laplacian derivative with respect to Laplacian. So I would get L Laplacian of m, and so forth through the methodologies of taking functional derivatives. <coughs> and then I have the noise. Okay. So this leads to an equation which is called the time dependent Landau Ginsberg. That is, we started with the Landau Ginsberg weight. And this equation, as we will see shortly, subject to a similar restrictions as we had before, will give us eventually this probability distribution. Okay? Now this is a difficult equation in the same sense that uh, the original Landau Ginsberg is difficult to look at correlations, etc. This is a nonlinear equation, causes various difficulties, and you need approaches to be able to deal with the difficult uh, nonlinearities. So, what we did for the Landau Ginsberg was to initially get insights and simplify the system by focusing on the linearized or Gaussian version. So, Let's look at the version of this equation that is linearized. And when it is linearized, what I have on the left-hand side is dm by dt. What I have on the right-hand side is mu. I have tm. I got rid of the uh, nonlinear term. So the next term that I will have will be k Laplacian of m, and then will be minus L fourth derivative of m, and so forth. And then there will be a noise eta of x. Okay? So, one thing that I can 
immediately do is to go to Fourier transform. So m of x goes to m tilde of q. And if I do that, but not Fourier transform in time, I will get that the time derivative of m tilde of q is essentially what I would have here. Uh, and I forgot the minus that I have here. So this is minus is important. Uh, and then this becomes negative. This becomes positive. So that when I go to Fourier transform, what I would get is minus t plus k q squared plus L q to the fourth and so forth and tilde of q with this mu out front and then the Fourier transform of what my noise is. Okay? First thing to note is that even in the absence of noise there is a set of relaxation times that is for eta equals to zero, or in general, I would have m tilde of q and t. I can solve this equation uh, kind of simply. It is dm by dt is some constant times m. Let's call it gamma of q, which has dimensions of one over time. So I can call that one over tau of q. If I didn't have noise, if I start with some original value at time zero, it is going to decay exponentially with this characteristic time. And once I have noise, it is actually easy to convince yourself that the answer is zero to t dt prime uh, e to the minus uh, this gamma of q or inverse of it. Tau of q times eta of q at t prime. So you see that you have a hierarchy of relaxation times tau of q, which are one over mu t plus k q squared and so forth which scale in two limits. Either the wavelength lambda, which is the inverse of Q, is much larger than the correlation length. And the correlation length of this model, we have seen to be the square root of T over K, the square root of K over T or the other limit, where lambda is much less than uh, c. In this limit, where we are looking at modes that are much shorter than the uh, correlation length, this term is dominant. This becomes 1 over mu k q squared. In the other limit, it goes to a constant 1 over mu t. So this linear equation has a whole bunch of modes that can be characterized by their wavelength or their wave number. We find that the short wavelength modes have this characteristic time that becomes longer and longer as the wavelength increases. So if you make the wavelength twice as large and you want to relax a system that is linearly twice as large, this says that it will take four times longer because the answer goes like lambda squared. Okay? Whereas eventually you reach the size of the correlation length. Once you are beyond the size of the correlation length, it doesn't matter. It's the same time. But the interesting thing, of course, to us is that there are phase transitions that are continuous. And close to that phase transition, the correlation length goes to infinity, which means that the relaxation time also will go to infinity. So according to this theory, there is a particular divergence as 1 over t minus tc. 
but it will be modified. And as I will discuss next time, this is only even within the dissipative class, one type of dynamics that you can have, and there are additional dynamics, and whereas this system characterizes at criticality a single universality class in statics, there are many uh, dynamical universality classes that correspond to the same static behavior.